Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Mark Medeiros. I am the Community Engagement Manager at Peninsula Open Space Trust. And on behalf of POST, as well as our partners at the Wildlife Education and Rehabilitation Center and the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, we wanna welcome you to tonight's webinar on this awesome little bird, the burrowing owl. I know you all are very excited. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land in post working area has been home to many distinct communities of native people since time immemorial. This is the ancestral territory of the Amamutsun, the Moekma Ohlone, Rame Tushalone, as well as many other individual descendants and as well as tribes and organizations in the greater uh, Bay Area. So wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the native people whose land you are on and think about how you could support these communities directly. I wanna share a little bit about the co-hosts of this event tonight. For those of you less familiar with POST, we've helped to protect over 80,000 acres of land in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Northern Santa Cruz counties since our founding in 1977. We are a private 501c3 nonprofit land trust supported by the community. And I wanna say thank you to all of you who are watching, who are donors and followers and supporters. It's absolutely because of you that this work has been possible. The Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority or OSA works to protect the quality of life in Santa Clara County by preserving open space and natural resources. Since 1993, the authority has protected over 28,000 acres, providing ecologically friendly outdoor recreation and preserving the natural beauty and environmental health of the Santa Clara Valley. Lastly, the Wildlife Education and Rehabilitation Center, also known as WERC or WORK, provides the community with rehabilitation services for orphaned, injured, and sick native wildlife. Through their educational programs, work encourages a peaceful coexistence between civilization and our native wildlife. So caring for wildlife and habitat in our region is a big team effort. There are many organizations involved in this work in our area. And the story of the burrowing owl provides a great example of how this work is done in collaboration amongst um, many of these groups. So despite the many challenges faced by the burrowing owl, they continue to call the South Bay home. And it's thanks to the efforts of various groups that do research, habitat protection and restoration, captive breeding and other elements of this holistic recovery program. So tonight you'll be hearing about the roles played by the co-host organizations for this talk, as well as the role that many other organizations play in um, caring for the burrowing owl. And we are very privileged to have two incredible experts on burrowing owls joining us tonight, uh, Philip Higgins and Sandra Menzel of Talon Ecological Research Group. And this is a nonprofit organization founded in 2015 that conducts scientific research informing conservation decisions while also providing students and early career biologists with opportunities in an environmental science education, research, conservation, and environmental planning. Sandra and Philip have very deep experience working with burrowing owls. I think by my calculation, over 35 years of experience, they could let us know if that's accurate. Um, but a very, very wonderful local experts. We're very privileged to have their time um, and for them to be sharing with us tonight. So with that, I'd like to welcome them to the program. Hey, Sandra. Hey, Philip. Hello. How are Hi. you? Nice to see you both. Thank you for making it tonight and for setting aside some time to share with the community. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and I know a lot of folks are very um, excited in chat already. Um, before we begin, I know you have a lot of stuff to share. I wanted to ask, um, what roads brought you to wildlife research and the burrowing owl? 
you know, how did you arrive in this role that you both are in and what, uh, what motivates you to do this work? Maybe um, folks would, I think, like to meet you both learn a little bit about you. I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I actually was doing my GE at Mission College in Santa Clara. And um, I was an engineering student at the time. And one day I was walking from the parking lot to the campus. And I actually saw, I knew it was an owl, was on the ground during the daytime. So the first thing I presumed was injured. Um, so I went over to it and I started flying from one borough to another borough. So I knew it wasn't injured. And I went in and asked one of my teachers, and she said it was a burrowing owl. So I got involved uh, my first year and actually changed my major from engineering to environmental studies. Wow. And I ended up doing my thesis on burrowing owls. And from that first day, I was always working with burrowing owls. So I never set out to work with them, just kind of all That's fell amazing. Me. A brewing owl appeared to you and, <laughs> and the first time. wow thank you what about you sandra um i started working with birds of prey during my undergraduate at uc santa cruz and worked with the predatory bird research group um and then i started working for a consulting firm albion environmental in santa cruz and they uh did a lot of and are still um doing a lot of management and conservation projects with burrowing owls. And that's how I got started uh, with them. And I also did my grad research on burrowing owls and um, the rest is history, I guess. That's great. And um, I've, I've enjoyed getting to meet you both. And I appreciate so much that uh, these birds are on the landscape. I'm, I'm still waiting to see one myself, but I, I know everybody's very excited to hear about your research and learn about the birds. And I know you have a lot to cover, so we're gonna get into it. Um, just so everybody knows, we'll try to save a few minutes at the end for Q and A. So feel free to drop your questions into chat at any time and we'll get to as many as we can um, before we give you some ideas about how you could support this work and then we close. So with that, I'm gonna add your slides here um, so the audience could see that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you two. Thank you. Okay. So today we're just gonna cover um, some basic information on the ecology of burrowing owls. Then we're gonna discuss some of the conservation projects and research studies that Sandra and myself and the other biologists in Tallinn are working on. So here's a burrowing owl, uh, the Western burrowing owl. The photo on the right-hand side is an adult. And on the left-hand side, we have a couple of young birds or an artificial burrow. So burrowing owls are only found in the Americas. They're found from uh, Southern Canada to the Southern tip of South America at Tierra del Fuego. There is approximately 18 subspecies uh, throughout the Americas. And in North America, we have two subspecies. We have the Florida burrowing owl, and in our area, we have the Western burrowing owl. So it's found west of the Mississippi River, Southern Canada, and into Northern Mexico. And in California, we're very fortunate because we have resident birds, which are breeders, and we also have migratory owls, which come down from Canada, uh, Washington, and Oregon. Um, so listing for these birds, they're actually listed as endangered in Canada. They're actually the only bird of prey with an endangered listing in Canada. In Mexico, there are threatened species. And in most other states, including California, are listed as a state species of special concern. So during the 1990s, they conducted a statewide census of burrowing owls in California. So on the map on the screen now, the red areas are where burrowing owls became extirpated as a breeding species. So they're locally extinct in these areas. So there still may be wintering owls, but no more breeding owls. And the yellow areas is where they're on the verge of becoming extirpated, including Santa Clara County. Then in the mid 2000s, they followed up with an additional second uh, statewide census. So you can see an increase in the red areas where they're extirpated for breeding birds and a big increase in the yellow areas. But if you look at the bottom of California, right on the border with Mexico in the Imperial Valley, about 70% of the total California population is located, located in that one area. 
So it's very bad to have a big population of any species concentrated in one area. And this area is a semi-arid area. And the only reason there's owls there is because of irrigation for agriculture. But unfortunately, recently, a lot of that water is being uh, diverted to urban areas. So we could experience a large crash in that population in this area. So in Santa Clara County, um, what's really surprising is most of the burrowing owls are in uh, the South uh, Bay or Northern Santa Clara County. So they're in very, very urban areas. So the problem is there's very limited possibility for expansion of these populations. So in the 1980s, we had about 500 burrowing owls at 250 locations in Santa Clara County. We're now down to four breeding locations and about 40 individual adults. So protective status, they're protected under the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. They're a national bird of conservation concern. And in California, they're designated as state species of special concern. The problem with this listing, it does protect the owls, you cannot kill them. But with mitigation, you can destroy the habitat. And what happened in the past was, they, if a developer wanted to destroy habitat, they could purchase credits in a conservation bank in another location. But that physically did not involve relocating the owls. So as more and more development came along, more habitat was protected in this mitigation bank with the loss of habitat in Santa Clara County, which resulted in a decline of burrowing owls. Um, so scientific name is Athena clinicalaria hypogea. Um, that's a male in the center. Um, it's about nine inches tall um, and has a uh, mottled coloration and it weighs about a quarter of a pound. So the photographs on the right hand side, uh, they show uh, the young. So they don't have that mottled coloration on their um, chest. They actually have a, a uniform fawn coloration. So burrowing owls only live for about five years um, on average. Um, so high mortality rates, but they do have a high reproductive potential. So there's about 140 different species of owls in the world. And burrowing owls are the only species that roost and nest underground. So a very unique attribute. They're diurnal and nocturnal. So during the daytime, they just stand at the burrow entrance for the majority of the day. They will do some foraging in the breeding season if they have chicks, but most of the foraging is at nighttime, um, especially dusk and dawn. Then a burrow is essential for survival. Uh, a very unusual attribute of the young is they can mimic the sound of a rattlesnake. So in 20 years that I've been researching burrowing owls, I've only heard it three times. And you have a very unusual um, attribute. They'll often place dung and decoration around the burrow. And Sandra's gonna talk about more of that um, when she's discussing the breeding season. And they do not hoot like most owls. So typical habitat, they like, sh like short grasslands. So I mentioned already that they're only nine inches tall and they sit at the burrow entrance most of the day. If the vegetation grows taller than them, they can't see predators approaching. So they'll often abandon the burrow. So maintaining that short vegetation is critical for um, keeping burrowing owls at a particular location. Unfortunately, a lot of grasslands are converted to agricultural uh, crops or for urban development. And especially with the price of land in Santa Clara County, it's very difficult to have extensive contiguous grasslands. So although burrowing owls are found at airports and also on golf courses, it's not always true choice. Sometimes they're the only habitat left available in urban areas. So despite their names, they don't actually dig their own burrows. They use the burrows of fossorial mammals. So throughout most of their range, it's prairie dogs. They're here in California, it's the California ground squirrel. So they actually have a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with the ground squirrels. They don't live in the same burrow as a ground squirrel, but they do live in the same colony. And another unusual um, attribute, ground squirrels are actually very, very clean if you look at their burrows. They actually even make a latrine where they poop in it. Burrowing owls, on the other hand, are kind of uh, more dirty. They, you'll see their whitewash, which is their um, droppings, pellets, prey remains. And I've often seen it where an owl will use a burrow for several weeks or several months. It moves out, a ground squirrel comes into the same burrow, cleans it up, and then two or three days 
later, the burrowing owl uh, evicts the ground squirrel and gets a nice clean burrow. Mm -hmm. So it's a, although they say it's a mutualistic relationship, I think the owls benefit more than the squirrels. Unfortunately, squirrels are often considered pest species and are often eradicated um, to reduce the damage that they're perceived to create. So a decline in ground squirrels also impacts burrowing owls. But they also live in artificial burrows. Um, so the top photograph shows the typical burrows that we use. So some people use wooden boxes. We use an irrigation valve box. It's a plastic box. And then for the tunnel, we use a, a flex drain pipe. So our design is based on a design that Jack Barkley used at San Jose Airport, uh, where Sandra actually used to work. So the pipe he used was four, three inch diameter, sorry, four inch diameter, which is a typical ground squirrel diameter burrow. We never had much success with them. So we actually moved to a six inch pipe and we cut a slot out of the bottom of the pipe. So the owls actually walk on the ground, not walking on plastic. The first uh, artificial burrows of this design that we installed, we put them in on a Friday and the following Monday, owls had moved um, into them. And last year, over 90% of the burrowing owls in our project areas used artificial burrows. So now Sandra is going to continue with uh, the ecology. All right. Um, burrowing owls have lots of predators uh, from all directions. Mammalian predators include skunk, badger, fox, uh, cats and dogs. Then we have um, snakes that may go into the burrow to eat eggs mainly or the nestlings. Uh, aerial predators might hit the adults um, outside the burrow during the breeding season or during migration. Um, we see a lot of red-tailed hawks, golden eagles, barn owls, uh, great horned owls. And so that's why burrowing owls have to produce a lot of offspring because uh, a lot of the offspring doesn't make it through the first winter. Probably 75% of the young doesn't survive the, um, the first winter. Um, the diet is very varied. Um, they are opportunistic, eating a lot of invertebrates, especially insects. Um, Phil will talk a little bit about that. Uh, he did his research for his grad studies on diet and um, looked at a lot of pellets, uh, leftovers. Um, and the diet also changes during the seasons, during the spring and summer, uh, they eat a lot of insects, especially when they have young. And then during the winter, they might switch more to hunt uh, during the night. Um, voles and gophers and so forth. During the breeding season, which is from February to August, uh, we see a lot of uh, decoration out, out front the burrow. Um, what we see here in that picture is actually goose pellets, uh, goose droppings they collect and put outside their burrow. Uh, historically, it was probably buffalo dung. Now they collect also cow dung, or um, we have seen dog poop, <laughs> and uh, so different different sorts of dung that they decorate the burrow with. But it also has a different purpose. Most likely, um, people or researchers uh, don't know a hundred percent. But one theory is that they put dung outside the burrow to in attract insects to the burrow entrance so that they can eat the insects. That's smart, right? Have your um, your food source right out, out front your front door. Um, the other um, thought is that maybe they are trying to cover up their own smell. Um, here again, more pictures of young and adult owls, as already Phil said, um, on top, the two top pictures are of young, which are more just uniform brown, and then the spotted um, adults on the bottom. Ooh. Ah, what did I do now? Say next. Sorry about that. Uh, here we have a male and female during the breeding season. They are pretty monomorphic, meaning that they cannot be distinguished, distinguished much just by size. Um, 
or coloration much during the winter for sure. Uh, they look pretty much the same. You cannot tell if it's a male or a female, but during the breeding season, the male gets a much lighter plumage because he will sit outside the burrow keeping watch while the female is underground on her eggs or brooding the young and she will remain much darker. So here we see the female on the left hand side and the male is on the right hand side. Uh, once again, talking about decoration, so not just decoration with the dung, um, but they also collect items um, like little magpies looking for shiny things sometimes, soy sauce packages, cigarette butts. Um, we have seen from playground the ground up rubber. They have collected that and decorated their borough entrance with that. On the right hand side, we see a lot of whitewash and molted feathers, um, and it's just signaling basically the sparrows occupy. This is a female underground. Um, they can lay up to 12 eggs. Uh, often we see between six and nine eggs. Uh, they may not all hatch, but again, uh, it's sort of producing a lot of offspring because not, not all will survive. The female does all the incubating while the male is outside hunting and uh, keeping watch. Um, and he will hunt for the female and bring her food. And once the eggs hatch, uh, he will also provide food for the offspring. And here's a, for the U and A factor. Uh, we added a few cute photos. Um, so owls lay um one egg a day approximately and then they start incubating when they're maybe on their third egg so we see size differences between the young you can see in the left top picture a really small young um, whereas the two sitting out front are already a little bit bigger and older they come outside um, starting maybe when they're 14 days old, which always makes us very nervous. Like, why are you outside? You should be um, hiding. Um, and then when they're about a month old, they will start flying. They fledge uh, as a family group and the parents will continue to provide food even though um, the young birds can already fly. But they are not very good at hunting quite yet. So the, the parents um, provide more food as they grow up. That is a very small young that um, made it outside the burrow on its own, I think, right, Phil? And, yes, yeah. Uh, Phil just put it back into the burrow, but this bird might be about 14 days old. <clears throat> now talking about habitat, um, decline and, and population decline. So starting in the 70s, 80s, we already saw the numbers of burrowing owls going down. There were many, many burrowing owls throughout Santa Clara County in, in old days, and um, they were a very common bird. But then in the 80s and heading into the 90s with the tech boom and um, the urban areas growing and the grasslands disappearing, and agricultural areas being converted, we lost many of the, the suitable, suitable habitat and uh, population started to really decline. Uh, as you can see here uh, by 60% just in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, here we have numbers of the last eight years, adults and young during the breeding season. If you look at the bottom row, you can see that the number of adults from 2014 to 2021 declined drastically from 116 individuals to 36 for the adults. And um, with fewer adults, we also see uh, less offspring. And um, as Phil already mentioned, we basically now see breeding burrowing owls at four locations. Um, the last three years, unfortunately, we lost one more breeding location at Don Edwards uh, National Wildlife, Wildlife Refuge at Warm Springs. And we haven't seen breeding pairs there for the last three years. 
Um, here's a long-term data set, which is a little bit misleading, uh, the ups and downs, just because not all sites always got um, surveyed. But the main takeaway message here is that um, the population is declining. We had uh, a good year in 2004 and five, and since then it really has gone downhill. Um, that may be because of the drought years, there was not a lot of food going around. In 2017, we had a lot of rain uh, late in May, for example, where we lost a lot of breeding pairs and young. And since then, the population really hasn't recovered. Uh, here, once again, are the remaining breeding sites. Um, to the west, we have Shoreline and Moffat. Um, on, the, on the northern end, uh, Warm Springs, that's the one where we don't see breeding pairs anymore. Um, and then San Jose Airport on the southern end. And um, the last one is the regional wastewater facility in Alviso. And the um, breeding habitat really has uh, contracted in the last many years. So four remaining breeding uh, burrowing owl colonies that we have, and they all have their challenges. Uh, Shoreline Park, Moffat Field, they are neighboring breeding sites. A lot of construction going on around there at Shoreline Park. We have a lot of um, people being interested in owls, but also uh, creating a little bit of uh, disturbance, wanting to take photographs, uh, lots of visitors on foot. Um, but Shoreline has installed a tall fence for the main area where we had breeding pairs, and that really is protecting a lot of um, the nests, which is wonderful. Moffat Field is an active airfield. They don't really want owls near the runways, which makes sense because of uh, collision with aircraft. Um, there's also construction going on uh, and quite a bit of disturbance. Uh, the wastewater facility uh, also has seen a lot of development around it. Um, and we have lost a lot of um, foraging habitat in that area. And uh, San Jose Airport, obviously a growing airport, also has lost quite a bit of habitat on the airport itself. Um, and it's challenging to manage a burrowing owl population uh, on an airport. It is possible, but again, it's challenging. And Phil continues. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the conservation and research projects. So they say it takes a village to raise a child and to save any species, including burrowing owls, it takes a multitude of different organizations and specializing in different areas. So I just want to mention some of the organizations. This is not them all, um, there's just so many uh, to include. So one is the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. They're providing funding for a lot of the research and conservation projects in active uh, management and uh, protection of owls. Then we have the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the United States uh, Fish and Wildlife <coughs> Service. Uh, we work with them for the permits. Then we have landowners, uh, the City of San Jose, City of Sunnyvale, City of Mountain View, NASA Ames, and Google. So these are these um, organizations, they own the land where the remaining burrowing owls are um, located. And it's uh, thanks to the help from these organizations that we still have burrowing owls out there. And then we have Post and Open Space Authority, which just recently uh, purchased and are managing a lot of habitat in Coyote Valley, which is more urban. And we hope to, in the long term, rural, um, move the burrowing owls down to those areas. Then we have Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, which have been uh, pivotal with uh, advocacy of birds in general, for especially burrowing owls. And then we have uh, Work, Peninsula Humane Society in Burlingame, and a lonely in Fremont. So we're actually partnering with these three organizations for our captive breeding and also our overwintering uh, projects. So a lot of organizations, then we have actually hundreds of volunteers which come from San Jose State University and uh, which actively help us uh, with management. So some of the conservation methods we're using, um, as Sandra mentioned already, 
disturbance, human disturbance can have a big impact on nesting burrowing owls uh, during the breeding season. So because there are site tenacious and have burrow fidelity, you often use the same burrows year after year and they're very easily found. And sometimes some people have a tendency to put their locations and photographs up on social media, which attracts a lot of people. So we do want people to enjoy burrowing owls. The problem is when you get 50 to 60 people per day uh, getting very, very close to the owls and causing them to flush, it will actually uh, abandon the burrows. So the photograph, the top left-hand corner is fencing that was installed. So all the remaining burrowing owls, about 90% of them are nesting within fenced areas. Um, they seem to know that there is better protection and it is critical for their long-term survival. So you mentioned that burrowing owls like sharp vegetation when they're nesting. Um, their prey, the invertebrates and also the rodents, they prefer a mosaic of different habitats, uh, taller vegetation. So the photograph in the top right-hand corner, and that's an example at Shoreline and Mountain View, where we've planted over 2,000 low-growing California native plants. So they're providing cover and also an additional food source year-round for rodents and invertebrates. So in the prime nesting areas, we're keeping sharp vegetation and around the periphery of those nesting areas, we're planting natives to increase the prey base. The bottom left-hand uh, photograph is volunteers installing artificial burrows in a mound. So this location is in Alviso, and Alviso is actually 13 feet below sea level and is very prone to flooding. So in 2017, we had extensive flooding out of that area. So typically we don't put artificial burrows flush in the ground at this site. We usually put them in mounds or berms, to keep them above the flood zone. And the photograph on the right-hand side is volunteers putting wood chips down on yellow star thistle. So non-native invasive weeds are a big problem. Um, so the wood chips was um, a way that we suppress the weeds, but also increase the prey base. Um, a lot of invertebrates such as pill bugs um, and earwigs and Jerusalem crickets like the microclimate inside the wood chip areas. Then the photograph top left um, side is grazing. So to keep the vegetation short, at some sites we use grazing and cattle, and also we do mowing or a combination of both of them. Grazing on its own, it's very difficult to get the grazing animals to concentrate in the areas that you want to keep short. And cattle are great for eating grass, not necessarily weeds, whereas goats are good for eating weeds. And so usually it's a combination of different methods for vegetation management. And if you look at the two photographs on the bottom of the screen, this is mustard. Um, and for the past two years, mustard has been uh, very dominant at all of our locations. So mustard can grow up to about four or five feet tall, which is totally unsuitable for burrowing out habitat. So we have mowed it, we have sprayed it. And in these examples, it's volunteers removing the plants and trying to get them out from the roots. Another a conservation project we've done was we do have resident owls which are here year round and we have wintering owls which are usually found up in the upland areas on the Diablo range and also on the Santa Cruz range. So in the open space preserve at Sierra, Vest Sierra Vista we have wintering owls there most years. So a couple of years ago we installed artificial burrows to see if we could encourage those owls to remain year round so the owls did use the artificial burrows, but only in the winter time. We never were capable of encouraging any owls to remain uh, year round. But we did get photographs of several other species, including the bobcat, coyote, and badger. So some of the research projects that we're are working on, we'll go through them uh, one by one. So monitoring is very, very important. So the two photographs at the top show talent biologists uh, conducting surveys of the areas. So it's critical at the start of the breeding season to find out the location of the nesting burrowing owls to follow up for further research projects. So we do transect surveys um, at the start of the breeding season to locate uh, active nests. Then we use the wildlife motion detection cameras. You can see the photograph in the bottom with a little burrowing owl on it. 
we put them up at the burrows so we can find out um, if the birds are banded or unbanded because our goal every breeding season is to band all the unbanded individuals. And the cameras are also great at um, giving us senses of how many chicks um, are available at the burrows because we do want to band them. So we have a very limited time period uh, to band the young. If we wait too long, we risk them moving offsite to another burrow. And if they're too young, the bands actually won't fit on their legs. So it's a very narrow time frame just to do that. From 2014 to 2018, we done a wintering, burrowing owl monitoring project. So within Santa Clara County, um, every winter, we went to any location where we knew there was burrowing owls and we banded those burrowing owls. And then we went back the following winter and also in the breeding season to see if the owls remained on site. Unfortunately, none of the owls in the win pure wintering areas remained to breed. Um, but these wintering sites are important to populations that are migrating south from Canada and Washington and Oregon. And actually, while we were out at Coyote Ridge one year, um, Sandra actually captured a burrowing owl, which was banded the same year as a, a, a young bird in British Columbia, Canada. So it migrated down to Santa Clara County for the winter and then returned um, back up to Canada, we presume. So diet analysis. Several studies were done on burrowing owls um, about 20 years ago, and they found out that on average, the owls were only producing three young per pair, but they do have the potential to lay 12 eggs. So we always presumed there was some sort of limitation on reproductive success. So we presumed it was probably related to diet. So we collected 3,092 pellets and we analyzed those pellets to find out what the owls were eating. And we found out that 98% of the diet was invertebrates and the number one species was earwigs. So burrowing owls typically only catch one prey item at a time. So if you have five or even 10 babies to feed and you're bringing back one earwig each time, uh, it's likely that the youngest birds are going to die. So we do know this is why we're planting all these native plants to encourage the prey base to get to a quality prey base. Habitat management. We do a lot of vegetation management, artificial burrows to encourage burrowing owls throughout the areas and planting native plants. Banding. So banding is actually critical to find out um, more information about the owls, which individuals are migratory, which are resident, who they're pairing up with each year, do they remain together for several years or pair up a new partner every year, and where they migrate within the different populations. So we put a USGS band on one leg and we put our own uh, band of our own choice on the other leg. And we use different colors and um, for different project sites and also for different projects. So if anybody ever sees any colored bands um, and it's possible to identify the unique ID codes, We'd really appreciate that information because we get a lot of information, critical information for our research. So one of the things we found from the banding was we're getting a lot of uh, inbreeding. So here's a genealogy chart that was created by our colleague, Deborah Kromzak. So this shows six generations of um, monitoring of individuals. So if you look at the far right hand uh, column, those two pink and those two green boxes, they're the same individuals. The pink is the female, the green is the male. So they produced offspring. And then the great grand, great grand um, offspring of those individuals paired up. So you actually had cousins uh, reproducing together. Then if you look at the bottom part of the columns, those two orange boxes is the same female. So that female, paired up with her own male offspring to produce, an op produce another generation of offspring. And that offspring paired up with the inbred individual from the other population. So as these populations get smaller and smaller, we're seeing more and more inbreeding. And um, so that's why we want to encourage migratory birds to remain on site and interbreed with our birds so we can increase our genetic diversity. Yeah, and that is a common problem, of course, with smaller and smaller populations. You have all sorts of problems such as inbreeding. And if you lose one individual, that really matters. Um, 
So having a small uh, population is, is challenging uh, and to recover from that is definitely challenging. One of um, the projects that we have implement, implemented since 2017 is supplemental feeding to help the few owls that are remaining. As Phil has already mentioned, um, diet may be a limiting factor in producing a greater number of offspring. Um, and so during the breeding season, as soon as we um, observe pairs, we feed owls twice a week with dead mice to help um, them being able to feed themselves, of course, at first, and then also their offspring. Uh, it will limit the number of trips they have to make, so to speak, to forage, uh, which may help um, that they don't get predated on if they can spend more time at the burrow and uh, stay put and protect the young. Um, maybe predation risk can be decreased uh, at the same time. Another project um, to help the owls along is juvenile overwintering, uh, which involves taking young that, that we capture anyways for banding and instead of putting them back into the burrow where we uh, took them from, we retain them and put them into facilities. Um, we are working with two facilities right now, Peninsula Humane Society in Burlingame. Um, they have a wildlife care facility. And uh, with work, which we have already mentioned earlier, um, since last breeding season, uh, we have been working with, with work and um, with with PHS uh, the last few years. So we take the young, uh, don't put them back into the burrow, but retain them for the winter, um, make them fat and happy. And then in the following spring, we release them as pairs, as breeding pairs. Um, and we have had a great success with that. Uh, we build enclosures in the field. It's called a soft release or hacking. So we don't just put the birds out into the field, but we put them into an, an enclosure so that they can get used to the new uh, environment and surroundings. And then the hope is that the pairs lay eggs. And um, once we remove the enclosure, when they have laid a full clutch of eggs, they sort of stay put because they have invested this energy already. Uh, and don't want to to leave the eggs behind. And it has worked like a charm. Um, the I, I will go into details later, but the first year we released five pairs and all five remained on site. Um, we don't always have the sex ratio that we want. So it's not always uh, even, let's say five males, five females. Sometimes we have four females and six males. And then we release the singles a little earlier so that they may uh, find a wild um, partner. That, that sounded weird. Anyways, mm -hmm. I'm moving on. Um, so here is what we have done so far with the juvenile overwintering project. The first year was 2019 where we started taking 13 juveniles out of uh, the wild and put them into captivity at PHS, Peninsula Humane Society. Um, and then the next spring, we released five pairs, as I said, soft release, um, and three single females. And um, from all of these birds together, we had 25 offspring. So that was really successful. In 2020, we repeated the same process. We took 12 juveniles into captivity and then uh, released the pairs the next year. Um, maybe it's too much to go into detail. Um, and then this year, um, we took in 17 juveniles um, and have them currently in captivity at PHS and at work and are releasing um, three single females in February and five pairs uh, in March. We also initiated a captive breeding program last year at the Ohlone Humane Society Wildlife Care Center. They have been amazing partners and converted one of their enclosures, which you see on the left, into two breeding enclosures uh, with the help of Boy Scouts, actually. 
Um, and we have burrows underground um, and had two pairs of burrowing owls in captivity. And one pair produced three offspring and the other pair produced one. So that was uh, successful. Um, here you can see the young in the enclosures. It was very exciting. Uh, we have cameras that we can um, watch remotely. And so it's uh, fairly entertaining. Um, this year we are building our own custom built facility um, with work and uh, the Habitat Agency is funding it. Um, and um, we will be moving the captive pairs to this new facility and hope that um, we can increase uh, reproductive rates. Um, we are very excited about this project and it's happening right now, actually. Uh, this photo on the bottom is fresh off the press. We just, um, last week maybe, yes. um, met with the Habitat Agency, posed OSA and work and looked at areas in the newly protected areas in Coyote Valley, which is so exciting. And I'm, I'm very happy that this work is happening. Um, and we are looking at areas where burrowing owls can be managed and maybe be reintroduced into Coyote Valley, as Phil mentioned earlier, into the rural areas, trying to get them out of the urban areas where we have a lot of failures. Um, so yeah, we are very happy that this is going forward and it was a very nice meeting um, with everybody. In conclusion, um, burrowing owls, are still declining and have been declining since at least the 80s, if not earlier. They can coexist in urban areas, uh, on golf courses, airports, and they can thrive, but they need to be managed properly and disturbance needs to be limited. Um, the essential requirements are fairly straightforward, um, but they are necessary. We need habitat, open grasslands, uh, we need ground uh, squirrels to provide burrows and um, there has to be enough prey. Um, we have been seeing an increase in predation too, so that's kind of a problem with shrinking habitat. More and more predators kind of get pushed into those small islands of grassland habitat and, and everybody is competing for resources and we have seen an increase um, in predation on burrowing owls, especially this year was pretty bad and very disappointing. And then lastly, short vegetation uh, is essential. Without short veg vegetation, we don't have burrowing owls. Uh, the newly protected areas, again, in Coyote Valley are very excited, exciting and, and they do pro provide the essential suitable habitat. And uh, we really hope that we can make it work uh, down in the Southern part of the county. With that, uh, we open it up to questions. Do you have anything to add? No, no. Okay. Wonderful, Sandra and Philip, thank you. And I'm just taking a moment to read this, this wonderful quote, a greening of the human mind must precede the greening of the earth. A green mind is one that cares, saves and shares. These are the qualities essential for conserving biological diversity now and forever. Wonderful. Thank you for including that at the end. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, and um, wow, wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and I'm reflecting here and I want um, folks to have a second to put their questions into chat. Um, first reflection is just, again, the, the wonderful landscape of um, organizations collaborating is very complex, yeah. multi-layered work. I was actually thinking, um, are you able to go back to that slide with all of your partners? I might pop that on the screen one more time to remind people. Um, and yeah, as you're doing that, you know, reflecting on, you know, how this, this species has been um, particularly impacted with our development pattern, as you were saying, they like the flatlands or they prefer um, that to somewhat, and we've obviously developed that 
to a higher degree. Um, and let me share this on the screen just to acknowledge everybody um, one more time. Um, and I was just reflecting also on, you know, the impact of very enthusiastic community members um, wanting to view the um, various the various uh, birds that are out there on the land. Um, I'm going to revise my earlier comment that, you know, well, I'm going to add something to my earlier comment that I've never seen one out in the wild. I've decided that I'm not going to try to. Maybe I'll, see, <laughs> maybe I'll see one someday, but I'm not going to go seek out these birds and add another person that's, um, you know, not trying to do harm, but kind of impacting them. This has been a, a bigger and bigger um, discussion in the birding community is, yes. is ethics yeah. around um, bird viewing and being careful, even if you're not right on top of the bird, you know, being somewhat close can disturb them. So that's another um, reflection that I'm having. So let's see, I'm going to glance through chat here um, and, and try to um, get to some of these questions that I, I noticed. Um, one thing uh, that I saw asked was about the I'm not sure if there's um, captive bred birds that have been released already. I didn't quite catch that part, but I know you've been overwintering birds. Um, is there anything you could share about, you know, early indications of success there or, or challenges? Um, maybe that's too early. No, um, we released birds at Shoreline and Mountain View in 2020. We released five pairs. All five pairs successfully reproduced that year okay. to a total of 21 chicks. Then that same year, we released um, three females in Alviso, three single females. We didn't have enough males to pair up with them. Two of those females found wild, wild males and they reproduced as well. Oh, wow. Well, okay. as a man. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wild males. <laughs> um, well, proof of concept there. So now we just have to keep. Um, you know, supporting you and all the organizations doing that. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, and, and um, that, so just to um, answer, answer the other question. So we had four young from the captive pairs and those we have um, merged basically with the overwintering birds and they will be released in uh, February and March this year. So wonderful. So very good and it was interesting to hear about the um the drought and how that impacted things and and the increase in predation um you know maybe it'll, it's ups and downs too so and with new areas that are um that you could potentially um release birds to like coyote valley that's that's great um there was a minor question um about the banding of birds and do you think the colors of the bird banding um uh might impact them in terms of camouflage or not really have, have you guys thought about that no Probably. they're they're so small the owls yeah. don't pay any attention to them at all right it, it wouldn't have any uh impact on them at all yeah and um that question came up about um, snowy plovers when we were discussing them too, and it just seems to not be much of a impact. Um, there's I mean, no even, way the, even the day you put them on the birds, uh, we have them on camera. They just don't seem to interact with the or even oh, okay. know that the band like fiddle with it or anything, huh? No, no, no. Um, well, here's a good one. Also, the. Uh, is there a mutual realistic relationship between the squirrels and um, the owls in any way? Or is it just owls entering into um, burrows that are abandoned? Or is there any kind of... Um, yeah. Go ahead. So a study was done. Um, I was on the thesis committee for one of for a student who done her, her thesis at Moffat Airfield on the interaction between California ground squirrels and burrowing owls. So both of them share the same predators. So we always presumed, and both of them have warning calls that each of them recognize. 
we always presumed that owls would see the predator first and give the warning call and both species would go underground. But a study wow. actually showed the opposite. The ground squirrels on average were the first to do the warning calls and the owls went underground um, based on the squirrels um, warning call. I see. So, like I said, the, the owls seem to benefit more from the squirrels. And if you have a large ground squirrel population, it provides more burrows for the owls because they don't dig their own burrows. And also, owls are less likely to be, to be predated by predators if there's a, a greater ground squirrel population. Hopefully a hawk or an eagle, I feel sorry for the squirrels, mm -hmm. will catch a squirrel instead of the owl. I see. Interesting. And yeah. Also, lastly, a lot of the prey items of the owls are found in the ground squirrel burrows. We've okay. seen uh, spiders, insects, rodents, frogs, all hmm. in the ground squirrel burrows. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and, they are considered yeah. ecosystem engineers and they are just really, really important to grasslands, uh, the ground squirrels are. Yeah. And along the lines with uh, warning calls, um, so burrowing owls are also considered semi-colonial, and that's another problem of small populations, shrinking colonies. Um, they warn each other, so they, they are warned by ground squirrels, but also um, they sort of warn each other and they benefit from having uh, other pairs around. I mean, not right next door, but uh, in, in, the, in one field or something. Um, and having fewer pairs you usually lose them as soon as they are like only one or two pairs they sort of blink out man well hopefully we get to a critical mass sometime in the future yeah. where you know you get that colony kind of um dynamics happening more and more um, Mary says, I will never look at a ground squirrel in the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, mission accomplished. Yes, uh, thank so, you. Yeah, do, um, so they don't eat the, they don't, they eat gophers, but they don't eat squirrels? squirrels. They don't kill ground squirrels. They will eat dead ground oh, okay. squirrels. Oh, that's good. I've often seen them going along the road and getting roadkill. Uh, okay. the but they don't kill adult ground squirrels. I see. Okay. Well, you know, we're getting to the end here and I want to leave room for um, a very important question, which has been asked a bunch of times, which is how do people um, support this work? Um, can you all, can you give some um, pointers for how people can get involved or support or, or plug um, a few ways to do that? Okay, well, we do partner with a lot of organizations, um, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, Peninsula Humane Society, Ohlone, and WERC, who are the co-sponsors of this um, presentation. So those organizations do depend on donations from um, the public to um, do a lot of the work that they're, they're doing, including uh, POST also benefits from that as well. So by helping those organizations, helps us because most of those organizations, all the work they're doing is in-kind services for the Burrowing Out project. Um, so we're doing the research part, but we do depend on all these organizations as partners um, and they're heavily dependent on donations for their existence. Hands there. on volunteering, we encourage you to contact uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society's website um, there are volunteer opportunities, usually, of course, now with COVID-19, uh, all of that is pretty much on hold, unfortunately. Um, we have done very little in terms of uh, volunteer work days, but hopefully one of these days we That's will be up running again. But uh, yeah, go to that website to find volunteer opportunities and you will see the Burrowing Owl uh, management um, opportunities there. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a whole list of organizations to look into. I had shared their um, URLs uh, and their websites in chat earlier. So if you glance back at the chat, uh, you will find links to all those organizations. You know, we really um, encourage you to, to donate if you can and to look out for those volunteer opportunities. Um, 
when they come up, you know, it, it does take a, a big community. Um, it's these organizations and then there are whole communities of people behind each organization. So it, you know, good job to all of you out there watching for supporting, um, this work too. You know, it's been a team effort for years and I want to say thank you one more time to you, to Sandra and Philip for sticking with this work for so many years. Uh, and for yeah. your no problem. And yeah. we have to also thank the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency for funding all the projects. Um, I think we have said it already in the yeah. beginning, but I do want to reiterate that uh, without them, um, many of these projects wouldn't be possible. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And um, thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you again for all of your sharing. And I feel um, very excited for the future of Burrowing Owls um, now. Uh, thank you both. And we'll see you all next time. All thank right. You. Bye. Bye.